right, hello again, chapter three, pages 46 to 64, trials and tribulation. After months of frustration, failure, and growing public scorn, Sheriff Thomas Tate, ABI lead investigator Simon Benson, and the district attorney's investigator Larry Igner decided to arrest Walter McMillan based on Ralph Meyer's allegation. They hadn't yet investigated Mr. McMillan, so they decided to arrest him on a minor protectual charge while they built their case, bigger case. During Meyer's strange testimonial, the suggestion that Mr. McMillan might also have sexually assaulted him arose. Alabama law had outlawed non-procreative sex, so officials planned to arrest Mr. McMillan on those charges. On June 7, 1987, Sheriff Tate led an army of more than a dozen officers to a backcountry road. When they found Walter's truck, they drew their weapons, forced him from his vehicle, and surrounded him. Tate told him he was under arrest. When Walter frantically asked the sheriff what he had done, the sheriff told him that he was being charged with sodomy. Walter told the sheriff that he did not understand the meaning of the word. When the sheriff explained the charge in crude terms, Walter was incredulous and couldn't help but laugh at the notion. This provoked Tate, who unleashed a torrent of racial slurs and threats. Walter would report for years that all he heard throughout his arrest were insults and threats of lynching. We're going to keep all of you from running around with these white girls. I ought to take you off and hang you like we done in mobile. Tate reportedly told Walter, referring to a haunting case in Mobile from only a few years before which the Ku Klux Klan had lynched a young African-American man named Michael Donald. The threats of lynching terrified Walter. He was also confused. If he was being arrested for raping another man, why were they throwing questions at him about the murder of Rhonda Morrison? Walter vehemently denied both allegations. In response, the officers locked him up. When T Ted Pearson, the district attorney of Monroe County, first heard his investigator's flimsy evidence against Walter McMillan, he must have been disappointed. Ralph Meyer's story of the crime was pretty far-fetched. Here is Meyer's account of the murder of Rhonda Morrison. On the day of the murder, Myers, Myers was getting gas. Walter McMillan saw him at the gas station, forced him at gunpoint to get into Walter's truck. Myers didn't really know Walter before that day. Once in the truck, Walter told Myers he needed him to drive because Walter's arm was hurt. Myers protested, but had no choice. Walter directed Myers to drive him to Jackson Cleaners in downtown Monroeville and to wait in the truck while Mr. McMillan went inside alone. After waiting a long time, Myers drove down the street to a grocery store to buy cigarettes. He returned 10 minutes later. After another long wait, Mr. McMillan finally emerged from the store and returned to the truck. He immediately admitted that he had killed the store clerk. Myers then drove Mr. McMillan back to the gas station so that Myers could retrieve his vehicle. Before Myers left, Walter threatened to kill him if he ever told anyone what he had done or seen or done. If so, in summary, an African-American man planning a robbery murder in the heart of Monroeville in the middle of the day stops at a gas station and randomly selects a white man to become his accomplice by asking him to drive him to and from this crime scene because his arm is injured even though he had been able to drive himself to the gas station where he encountered Myers and to drive his truck home after returning Myers to the gas station. Law enforcement officers knew that Myers' story would be very difficult to prove, so they arrested Walter for sodomy, which served to shock the community and further tarnished Mr. McMillan's reputation. It also gave police an opportunity to bring Walter's truck to the jail for Bill Hooks, a jailhouse informant, to see. Bill Hooks was a young black man with a reputation as a jailhouse snitch. He had been in the county jail on burglary charges at the time. Mr. McMillan was arrested. Hooks was promised release from jail and reward money if he could connect Mr. McMillan's truck to the Morrison murder. Hooks eagerly told investigators he had driven by Jackson Cleaners near the time of the crime and seen a truck tear away from the cleaners with two men inside. At the jail, Hooks identified Walter's truck as the one he'd seen at the cleaners nearly six months earlier. This second witness gave law enforcement officials what they needed to charge Walter McMillan with capital murder in the shooting death of Rhonda Morrison. There was joy and relief in the community. Finally, someone had been charged. Sheriff Tom Tate, the district attorney, and other law enforcement officers were cheered. People who knew Walter, though, found it difficult to believe he could be responsible for such a sensational murder. Black residents told Sheriff Tate that he had been had arrested the wrong man. This was a man who had no history of crime or violence and robbery just didn't make sense for someone who worked as hard as he did. Tate still had not investigated Mr. McMillan himself, his life or background, or even his whereabouts on the day of the murder. 
He knew about the affair with Karen Kelly and had heard the rumors that Walter's independence as a black man must mean he was dealing drugs. As it turned out on the day of the murder, a fish fry had been held at Walter's house. Members of Walter's family spent the day out in front of the house selling food to passerby to raise money for the local church where Evelyn Smith, Walter's sister, was a minister. There were at least a dozen church par par parishioners at the house all morning with Walter and his family on the day Rhonda Morrison was murdered. Walter didn't have a tree job that day. He had decided to replace the transmission in his truck and called over his mechanic friend, Jimmy Hunter, to help. By 9.30 in the morning, the two men had dismantled Walter's truck, completely removing the transmission. By 11 o'clock, relatives of Ryden had started frying fish and other foods to sell. Police reported that Morrison, the Morrison murder took place around 10.15 a.m., 11 miles or so from Mr. McMillan's home at the same time that a dozen church members were at Walter's home selling food while Walter and Jimmy worked on his truck. In the early afternoon, Ernest Welch, a white man who worked for a local furniture store, arrived to collect money from Walter's mother for a purchase she had made on credit. Welch told the folks gathered at the house that his niece, Rhonda, had been murdered at Jackson Cleaners that morning. They discussed the shocking news with Welch for some time. Dozens of people were able to confirm that Walter could not have murdered, committed the murder. Church members, Walter's family, and the people who were stopping by the house to buy food. That group included a police officer who stopped by the house to buy a sandwich and noted in his police log that he had bought food at Mr. McMillan's house with Walter and a crowd of church folks present. Based on their personal knowledge of Walter's whereabouts at the time of the Morrison murder, family members, church members, black pastors, and others all pleaded with Sheriff Tate to release Mr. McMillan. Tate wouldn't do it. The arrest had been too long in the making to admit yet another failure. He and his investigators discussed it and agreed to stick with the accusation. Ralph Myers was beginning to have second thoughts about accusing Mr. McMillan. He too was being charged in the Morrison murder. In exchange for testifying against Walter though, he'd been promised that he would be favorably treated. Now it was starting to dawn on him that admitting to involvement in a high profile murder that he actually had nothing to do with was probably not smart. A few days before the capital murder charges against Mr. McMillan were made public, Myers told the police his allegations against Mr. McMillan weren't true. At this point, Tate and his investigators had little interest in Myers denying his own story. Instead, they decided to pressure Myers to produce more incriminating details. When Myers protested that he didn't have more because, well, the story wasn't true, the investigators weren't having it. Instead, on August 1st, 1987, they transferred both Myers and Walter from the county jail to death row, but on separate floors so they wouldn't interact. Death row is the most extreme punitive confinement permitted. Putting someone who has not yet had a trial into a prison reserved for convicted felons, let alone on death row, is almost never done. Even the other death row prisoners were shocked. It's unclear how Tate was able to persuade the prison warden to house two pretrial detainees on death row, although it's likely because he had connections from his days as a probation officer. Sheriff Tate drove Walter to Hallman a Correctional Facility a short ride away in Atmore, Alabama. Before the trip, the sheriff again threatened Walter with racial slurs and terrifying plans. When Walter McMillan arrived on Alabama's death row, an entire community of condemned men awaited him. A hundred or so death row prisoners have been sentenced to execution in Alabama since capital punishment was restored in 1975. Most of them were black, although to Walter's surprise, some were white. Everyone was poor and everyone asked him why he was there. Condemned prisoners in Alabama's death row unit were housed in windowless concrete buildings that were notoriously hot and uncomfortable. Each death row inmate was locked in a five by eight foot cell with a metal door, a commode, and a steel bunk by themselves for 23 hours a day. The temperatures in August consistently reached more than 100 degrees. Incarcerated men would trap rats, poisonous spiders, and snakes they found inside the prison to pass the time and to protect themselves. Isolated and remote, most prisoners had limited opportunity for exercise or visits and were held in disturbingly close proximity to the electric chair. The large wooden chair was built in the 1930s and inmates had painted it yellow before attaching its leather straps and electrodes. They call it Yellow Mama. With another scheduled execution fast approaching, condemned prisoners were talking about executions constantly when Walter arrived. For his first three weeks on Alabama's death row, the hor horrifically botched execution of John Evans was pretty much all he heard about. 
Evans had been electrocuted three times over the course of 14 minutes after electrodes were incorrectly fastened by corrections officers. The circumstances of his excruciating death haunted the other inmates. The whirlwind of the past weeks had left Walter devastated. His whole life had been unrestrained by another, by anyone or anything. Now he found himself confined in a way he could never have imagined. The racist taunts and threats from law enforcement officers who did not know him were shocking. He never experienced such contempt. He'd always been well-liked and gotten along with just about everybody. He genuinely believed the accusations against him had been a serious misunderstanding. Once officials talked to his family to confirm his alibi, he'd surely be released. When the days turned into weeks, Walter began to sink into deep despair. His body reacted to the shock of his situation. For days, he couldn't taste anything he ate. He couldn't calm himself. When he woke each morning, he would feel normal for a few minutes and then sink into terror upon remembering where he was. Prison officials had shaved his head and all the hair from his face. Looking in a mirror, he didn't recognize himself. He was used to working outside among the trees with the scent of fresh pine on the cool breeze. Now he found himself staring at the bleak walls of death row. Fear and anguish, unlike anything he'd ever imagined, settled on Walter. The judge, Robert E. Lee Key Jr., had appointed an attorney to represent Walter for his trial. But there was something untrustworthy about this white lawyer who didn't seem to have much interest in Walter's side of the story. Instead, his family raised money to hire the only black criminal lawyers in the region, J.L. Chestnut and Bruce Boynton from Selma Chestnut. Selma. Chestnut was fiery and had done a lot of civil rights work. Boynton's mother, Amelia Boynton Robinson, was a legendary activist. Boynton himself had strong civil rights credentials as well. Chestnut and Boynton failed to persuade local officials to release Walter immediately. Meanwhile, Sheriff Tate was furious that Mr. McMillan had hired outside lawyers. On the trip to Holman, he mocked Walter for thinking it would make any difference. Although the money to hire Chestnut and Boynton was raised by family members through church donations and by selling their few possessions, local law enforcement pointed to it as evidence that Walter was secretly hoarding money and that he wasn't the innocent man he pretended to be. Other prisoners had advised him to take action and file a federal complaint to fight against being illegally held on death row. When Walter, who could barely read or write, failed to file the various pleadings and lawsuits the other prisoners had advised him to file, some blamed him for his predicament. There were days when I couldn't breathe, Walter recalled later. I hadn't ever experienced anything like this before in my life. I was around all these murderers, and yet it felt like sometimes they were the only ones trying to help me. I prayed, I read the Bible, and I'd be lying if I didn't tell you that I was scared, terrified just about every day. Ralph Meyer's original plan of saying he knew something about Morris and murder had clearly backfired. He had also been charged with capital murder in the death of Rhonda Morrison and sent to death row. Myers was sinking deeper into an emotional crisis. From the time he was burned as a child, he'd always feared fire, heat, and small spaces. As the prisoners talked more and more about the details of execution, such as John Evans, Myers became more and more distraught. On the night of one execution, Myers was in full crisis, sobbing in a cell. There was a tradition on death row in Alabama that, at the time scheduled for the execution, the condemned prisoners banged on their cell doors with cups and protests. At midnight, while all the other prisoners banged away, Myers curled up on the floor in the corner of his cell, hyperventilating. When the stench of burned flesh that many on the death on, row, on the row claimed they could smell during the execution wafted into the cell, Myers dissolved. He called Tate the next morning and told him that he would say whatever he wanted if he would get him off death row. Tate immediately picked up Myers and brought him back to the county jail. Ordinarily, the Alabama Department of Corrections couldn't just put people on death row or let them off without court orders or legal filings, and certainly no prison warden could do so on his own. But nothing about the prosecution of Walter McMillan was turning out to be ordinary. With Myers back as the primary witness and Bill Hoods ready to say what he saw Walter's truck at the scene, crime scene, the DA believed that he could proceed against Mr. McMillan. This case, case was scheduled for trial in February 1988. The DA, Ted Pearson, was getting older and had plans to retire soon after 20 years on the job. He hated that his office had been criticized for failing to solve the Morrison murder more quickly. Pearson was determined to leave office with a victory and likely saw the prosecution of Walter McMillan as one of the most important cases of his career. His one lingering concern may have been a recent United States Supreme Court case that threatened a longstanding feature of high-profile criminal 
trials in the South, the all-white jury. Even 20 years after the Civil Rights Revolution, Monroe County went against legal requirements of racial integration and diversity. For example, African Americans were often excluded from jury service on felony crime cases in Monroe County. As far back as the 1880s, the Supreme Court ruled in Strauder v. West Virginia that excluding black people from the jury service was unconstitutional, but juries remained all white for de decades afterwards. In 1945, the Supreme Court upheld a Texas statute that limited the number of black jurors to exactly one per case. In deep South states, jurors, jury roles were pulled from voting roles, which excluded African Americans. Even after the Voting Rights Act passed, court clerks and judges still kept the jury roles mostly white through various tactics to undermine the law. Local jury commissions used statutory requirements that jurors be intelligent and upright to exclude African Americans and women. By the 1970s, the Supreme Court ruled that underrepresentation of racial minorities and women in jury pools was unconstitutional, but the practice of striking all or most African-American potential jurors was common. Striking, or using peremptory strikes, is a practice that allows lawyers to reject jurors without stating a reason why, which meant that defendants like Walter McMillan, even in country counties that were 40 or 50 percent black, frequently found themselves staring at all white jurors because all the black jurors had been struck. This was especially common in death penalty cases. Then, in 1986, the Supreme Court ruled in Batson v. Kentucky that prosecutors could be challenged more directly about using racially discriminatory peremptory strikes. This development gave hope to black defendants, but didn't necessarily stop prosecutors from finding loopholes to continually continue excluding black jurors. In cases like Walter, which had caught the community's attention, defense lawyers would often file a motion to change venue, to move the case from the county where the crime took place to a different county where there was less publicity and eagerness to convict. Usually though, judges reject the motion. In October, 1987, Chestnut and Boynton presented a change of venue motion. To their total surprise, Pearson agreed that the trial should be moved to the amount of pretrial coverage, due to the amount of pretrial coverage. Judge Key nodded sympathetically. Chestnut, who knew his way around the Alabama courts, was sure something bad was about to happen. Could the judge and the DA already have a plan? When the judge suggested that it be moved to a neighborhood, neighboring county so that witnesses wouldn't have far to travel, Chestnut remained hopeful. Almost all the bordering counties had fairly large African-American populations, between 32 and 70%, 72% black. Only wealthy Baldwin County to the south was atypical, with an Afri African-American population of just 9%. The judge took very little time deciding where the trial should be moved. We'll go to Baldwin County. The change of venue was disastrous for Walter. Chestnut and Boynton knew there would be very few, if any, black jurors. They also understood that it was an extremely conservative county that had made even less progress than Monroe in leaving behind the racial politics of Jim Crow. Chestnut and Boynton immediately complained, but the judge reminded them it was their motion. Walter worried about the venue change as well, but he still put his faith in this fact. No one could hear the evidence and believe that he committed this crime. He just didn't believe that a jury, black or white, couldn't convict him on the nonsensical story told by Ralph Myers, not when he had, had unquestionable alibi with close to a dozen witnesses. Meanwhile, Ralph Myers was once again having second thoughts. The February morning that the trial was set to begin, he told investigators that he could not testify because what they wanted him to say was not true. The trial was postponed and Myers was sent back to death row for refusing to walk, cooperate. Back at Hallman, it wasn't long before he again showed serious emotional and psychological distress. He was sent to the Taylor Hardin Secure Medical Facility in Tuckaloosa, the state hospital for the mentally ill. It did very little to change his predicament, though, and he was returned to death row after 30 days at the hospital. Realizing he could not escape the situation he created for himself, Myers finally agreed once and for all to testify against Walter McMillan. A new trial date was scheduled for August, 1988. By now, Walter had been on death row for over a year. As hard as he had tried to adjust, he couldn't accept the nightmare his life had become. His lawyers seemed happy that Myers was struggling. They told Walter it was a good sign that Myers had refused to testify, but it had meant another six months on death row for Walter, and he couldn't see anything encouraging about that. When they finally moved him to the Baldwin County Jail in Bay Minette for the August trial, Walter left death row confident he'd never return. 
He had befriended several men on the row and was surprised by how conflicted he felt about leaving them, knowing what they would soon face. Yet when they had called his name to the transfer office, he lost no time getting in the van to leave. The trial was short and clinical. Jury selection lasted just a few hours. Pearson used his peremptory strikes to exclude all but one of the African-Americans who had been summoned to serve on the jury. The state put Myers on the stand to tell his absurd story of Walter forcing him to drive to Jackson Cleaners. This virgin had Myers going to the cleaners where he saw Walter standing over the dead body of Rhonda Morrison. Bizarrely, he had also claimed that a third person was present and involved in the murder, a mysterious white man with salt and pepper hair who was clearly in charge of the crime and who directed Walter to kill Myers too. But Walter couldn't because he was out of bullets. Walter thought the testimony was so nonsensical. He couldn't believe that people were taking it seriously. Why wasn't everyone laughing? Chestnut's cross-examination of Myers made it clear that the witness was lying. When Chestnut refinished, Walter was sure that the state would simply announce that they had made a mistake. Instead, the prosecutor brought Myers back up to repeat his accusations as if repeating his lies enough times would make them true. Bill Hooks testified that he'd seen Walter's truck pull out of the cleaners at the time of the murder. And then he recognized the truck because it had been not modified as a low rider. Walter instantly whispered to his lawyers that he hadn't turned his truck into a low rider until several months after Morrison was murdered. His lawyers didn't do much with that information, which frustrated Walter. Then another white man Walter had never heard of, Joe Hightower, took the stand and said that he had seen the truck at the cleaners too. There were a dozen people who could talk about the fish fry and insist that Walter was at home when Rhonda Morrison was killed. His lawyers called only three of them. Everybody seemed to be rushing to get the trial over with and Walter couldn't understand it. The state then called Ernest Welch, a white man who said that he was the furniture man who collected money at the McMillan house on the day they were having a fish fry, but it wasn't the same day that his niece Rhonda Morris Morrison was murdered. He said that he had been so devastated that he went to the McMillan residence to collect money on a different day. The lawyers made their arguments, the juror retired, and less than three hours later, they filed back into the courtroom, stone-faced one by one. They pronounced Walter McMillan guilty. A week later, he sat in the van with shackles pinching his ankles and changed tightly wound around his waist. He could feel his feet beginning to swell because the circulation was cut off by the metal digging into his skin. The handcuffs were too tight and he was becoming uncharacteristically angry. Why you got these chains on me so this tight? The two Baldwin County deputies who had picked him up a week earlier had not been friendly on the ride from death row to the courthouse. Now that he had been convicted of capital murder, they were downright hostile. One seemed to laugh in response to Walter's question. Them chains is the same as they were when we picked you up. They just feel tighter because we got you now. You need to loosen this. Man, I can't ride like this. It ain't going to happen. So you should get your mind off of it. Walter suddenly recognized the man. At the end of the trial, when the jury had found that Walter guilty, his family and several of the black people who had attended the trial were in shock disbelief. Sheriff Tate claimed that Walter's 24-year-old son, Johnny, said, somebody's going to pay for what they've done to my father. Tate asked deputies to arrest Johnny and there was a scuffle. Walter saw the officers wrestle his child to the ground and place him in handcuffs. The more he looked at the two deputies driving him back to death row, the more convinced he became that one of them had tackled his son. The van began to move. They wouldn't tell Walter where he was going, but as soon as they got on the road, it was clear that they were taking him back to death row. He had been distraught and confused on the day of his arrest. He had been frustrated when the days turned into weeks at the county jail. He had been depressed and terrified when they took him to death row before he was even convicted of crime. But when the nearly all white jury pronounced him guilty, after 15 months of waiting for a vindication, he was shocked, paralyzed. Now he felt himself coming back to life, but all he could feel was seething anger. Walter realized that he had been foolish to give everyone, the prosecutors, the judge, the officers, the benefit of the doubt. Hey, I'm going to sue all of you. He knew he was screaming and that it wasn't going to make any difference. I'm going to sue all of y'all, he repeated. The officer paid him no attention. Loose these chains, loose these chains. He couldn't remember when he'd last lost control, but he felt himself falling apart. With some struggle, he became silent. That is the end of chapter three. All right, toodles.